Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we focus on the emerging fields of machine learning, data science and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can think of us like, well, car talk, because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway, as always, is Andy Leonard. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I'm doing really well. I I wrapped up the audiobook uh, uh, Headstrong by the Bulletproof Guy. Right. Uh, Very interesting stuff. I heartily recommend it. Um, Cool. Disclaimer, uh, Audible is a sponsor of ours, and if you go to thedatadrivenbook.com, you can pick up a free book if you're not already a member of uh, Audible, and uh, that is one I definitely recommend. Very cool. Well, you you recommended it to me earlier, Mm -hmm. and I looked at it, and I looked at my queue of books I'm still listening to and not finished with yet, and, you know, it's we're recording this on August 23rd, 2018. Um, my, my counter, I guess, resets in September. I've, we've used all the books that we have for free. And I was like, I probably have enough to last the next eight days. <laughs> so I will pick it up. And what I do, Frank, is when I, when I think like that is I'll actually put a reminder on my calendar with the link, you know, go, go get that book. And, um, yeah, September 1st, man, I'm going to pick it up and start listening to it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's what's really cool about Audible is that they, too, are, I think, very data-centric. One might even yes. say data-driven. Maybe, um, yes. Is that uh, every incarnation of the app I've seen, Windows, uh, iOS, and Android, there's a stats um, pane or feature where it'll show you how often you've listened and, and stuff like that. And I looked, and hmm. my numbers for April were, like, through the roof, April and, um, and uh, May. And, I, and since then, it's kind of slowed down i was like well i wonder why that is and and i realized it was because like i did a lot of business travel in uh those two months so. right <laughs> right right no that and that's that's what i did i mean i recently um i recently ran over to india and uh did the data platform summit over there asia's largest microsoft database uh, summit nice. and uh, almost a thousand people there frank it was incredible um and, but of course, it's about 40 hours of flight, just flights alone, right? Wow. <laughs> uh, back and forth, 20, 20 hours over and about 20 hours back. I think it was actually something more like 19 and 21, but it's, yeah, really close to 40 hours of flying. By the time you throw in the, um, the layovers, and of course, I live in the middle of nowhere, so I have to drive to an airport. That's a couple hours. You have to get there a couple hours early for international. And so, yeah, it was, it was just a lot of travel. But most of the time, I, I loaded up uh, all of my books. This is why I'm out of Audible credits now. Usually, I have mm-hmm. a couple in the bank. But I downloaded a bunch of stuff. I listened to, I think it was two new books and probably the beginnings of three old books. Just, you know, I, I was just trying to fill stuff in. Uh, great opportunity to do that. I got nothing else to do sitting on sure. the airplane. Um, so, yeah, it was it was awesome. I uh and then I turned around and did it again. I drove, I got back, I was home for a couple of days, drove to Atlanta, which is, you know, eight, nine hours uh, one way and did the same thing. So h- highly recommend Audible. I would recommend it even if they weren't a sponsor. Yeah, I, I, was, a, I was a subscriber uh, if, about 10 months before we were, um, they were a sponsor. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. A couple of years. I've been, I've been an Audible sponsor. For, uh, I've been an Audible user rather for a couple of years before they sponsored. And I actually kicked the, um, kind of kicked the account up. I went from the one credit a month deal to the two because uh, Stevie Ray, my oldest son, started listening to audio books. And, uh, you know, he's he's actually used up all of our credits, wow. even with two some months. And I've had to go and I had to go and buy them. But they have a pretty good deal. You can buy like three credits if you're out. No. Um, not too bad. But yes, I would recommend it even if uh, they weren't a sponsor. It's just a really great use of your time. Uh, you know, you don't have to look at anything, so you can do it while you're driving. Um, 
And I, I know you've got those bone conducting fancy schmancy Which are headphones, awesome. Frank. So oh, I love them. Do you uh, like great them for driving? They basically sit on your cheek. <laughs> they sit around your ears, um, and um, so they're harder to lose. Right. There's a story behind that. Um, they're all they're Bluetooth, <laughs> and basically it just puts the sound into your cheekbone, which then conducts through the bone uh, and straight into your ears. And so you can still hear what's around that you, cool. but you can listen to stuff. So it's, it's great when um, the kids are in the car and they're blasting like, uh, you know, Paw Patrol or something on that on the, on the car system. And I could be listening to, you know, something I want to listen right. to, and, but I can still hear the road. I can, if they call me, I can hear them. Right. Um, and it's not as uncomfortable as having one ear like in a headset and then not. Yeah. So I love oh, yeah. It. Oh, yeah. 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 I like that better. So I have some, but um, as soon as I got them, Stevie was like, "Hey, I want to try those." And so those those really those, those kids will get you, man. But every you time. know, it's interesting. <laughs> oh well, it's I'm used to it. I have five, so you know. The uh, it's interesting you mentioned though the recommender systems because our guest today, we're very honored to have Jake Mannix with us. He is chief data engineer at at LucidWorks. I got to tell you, Jake, you're the only other person that we've had on the show. And I think the only other person I've seen that uses that title, uh, chief data engineer, I use that title at um, enterprise data and analytics. So I like the title. Um, And it says here, you, you work on recommender systems uh, among among other things, distributed systems, architecture, uh, learning and search, um, uh, you know, leading a team, uh, with uh, 15 years plus of software engineering experience and currently specializing in developing and applying distributed machine learning and search relevance algorithms to create compelling data-driven, I wanted to get to that part in your LinkedIn profile, data-driven <laughs> products across a wide variety uh, of industries. I, you can go look Jake up on, uh, on LinkedIn like I just did um, and, and learn more. Uh, I just sent you a connection request. I love LinkedIn, by the way. I, it's, it's my new favorite uh, social media. And I'd, I'd just like to welcome you, Jake. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Jake is my older son's name. So uh, it's a great name. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> so if, if Frank yells that at you, don't take it personally. <laughs> right. It's someone it's else. someone else. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Jake, uh, would you like to tell us, uh, you know, I, I certainly I read through your bio that you've got published there on LinkedIn. Uh, can you tell us more about what you do? Maybe something cool you're working on right now? Yeah. So, so you know, these days, um, you know, I kind of work in a sort of, you know, as you were mentioning, this chief data engineer is a, is a, is a kind of rare uh, title. There are, there are chief data scientists out there. Right. And that tends to take the role of, what used to just be called, you know, chief scientist, but you're at a, you know, a tech company that's got a lot of data. Right. Um, so that, that's a traditional role with just a slightly new name. Uh, chief data engineer, um, at least in, in my case, it's, it's taking the role. I, I work in kind of the, 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 the research uh, branch of, of the company. Um, and we, you know, we handle kind of this nice kind of full cycle R&D where, you know, essentially we start kind of by doing um, outbound technical marketing, really. Like we go out and talk with customers or potential customers okay. um, and find out whether any of their problems are currently stretching the envelope of what our kind of data product does, um, which is kind of a mix of recommender systems, search engine, uh, machine learning as a service uh, data platform. Okay. And... You know, we get to go actual talk with customers and convince them to give us some of their data. If they're already customers, then that's easy. If they're not yet customers, that's a negotiation. Um, but it's great because, you know, you're doing kind of marketing in the sense that, you know, the, in the real way, not not the kind of uh, PR style marketing. It's, it's trying to find out what is this, uh, um, what are the customers really needing to do that we can't yet do. Right. And from an engineering standpoint. And this is not from a standpoint of like, let's gather requirements and, you know, kind of then spend six months talking to engineers and other people. Right. We then take it back ourselves and build something on top of it. And if it requires modifying the source code to our core engine, that's okay because we're engineers and data scientists who, you know, are working with that day in and day out. So then we build a proof of concept for the customer. We help them out. 
Um, hopefully they like it. We then do that with a couple different customers and see if there's something that we've learned that matches across all of the these particular problems together. And then go back and say, okay, now let's spend a little bit of time doing real fundamental R&D. Let's say we had a recommender system product that was working well, but people, a lot of our customers had, you know, time series problems that they want to do recommenders on top of that. And we didn't have time series recommenders currently. Huh. So we're like, okay, well, let's do some actual research, read some papers, find out if there's open source um, code that does this already, build something for them in a general way, not just for one customer. Um, and then finally close <laughs> the loop and go back to the product engineering organization and say, hey, um, we've already got three customers currently paying for this thing that isn't actually part of our product that we kind of <laughs> built on top of our products. Right. We should probably make this a thing we sell. Oh, man, man, I tell you, you're right here. I'm, uh, I'm patting my heart. You're just, you're just right here. I love engineering driven uh, organizations. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer by trade and training. I started in electronics and um, started doing what's now called data engineering before I even knew what it was called. Uh, back in the day, yep, I was building, exactly. you know, building apps. Back back in the day when we used to carve our own chips out of wood, Jake, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so that's awesome. I love that. I love that cycle you just described. I, there's a lot of things to love in there. One is that it's very market driven. And I find that that organic, you know, process to be just just a way. I mean, you're letting the your customers tell you exactly what to build. And so you're, you have no inefficiency. Yeah, it's really nice. It's a lot of organizations do this as an organization, but it's rare for, you know, individual small teams to be the people doing it, each, each of the pieces of that themselves. Yeah, love that. Um, and it really does kind of tie, help tie it all together, keep you in touch with the customer, help you in, keep, but, you know, consultants are really good at being in touch with the customer, but they're going from one to the next, to the next, to the next, right. and they never have time to actually build a general solution. Right. Um, product engineering is building these great, you know, general solutions, but generally product engineers don't really want to deal with customers. They, they want to deal with them if they're really solving a, fixing a bug they made, right. but they don't want to go spend out their day kind of working with the customer problems because they're, they're technical people that want to do their, their technical thing. Maybe they're shy. I know lots of engineers that are relatively shy and don't want to be out talking to customers, <laughs> but getting to do kind of all of it all at once is, um, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a struggle to kind of keep. Uh, focused when you have, you know, interrupt driven customer stuff together with, you know, management and, and working with engineers who want to be heads down. But uh, it's, it's the challenge is also part of the fun. I love it. Absolutely. Right. So I think it's also, it's also interesting that you, you have customers kind of lead you um, to your, your engineering efforts. Does that help in the sales cycle? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's got to, right? It totally does. Um, in some sense, in some sense, it does a little too much. Um, in the okay, sense how, that, how can that be too good? <laughs> how can that be too good? Well, the way it can be too good is the customer. Like I said before, we often have to, you know, you know, research goes over to the product engineer and be like, "So, we've got this great idea that we really should get out in the field real quick." And they're like, "Let me guess, someone's already paying for this." <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> <have> are. <laughs> We already need to support it, and we need to make this part of the product um, because the customer liked the proof of concept so much that they're like, "Okay, let's just put it in production." We're like, whoa, this was a proof wow. of concept. They're like, no, 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 this works great, high enough quality. Your SLAs are awesome. Yep, we're like, but that's because we're maintaining it right now ourselves. What happens when like we step away? What do you mean step away? You're going to do this, right? <laughs> no, but okay, let's make that something real. So that's that's sort of the case where you build something. So kind of, you know, what the customer really wants that um, they kind of want it immediately. Um, I, I tell so, you, I, you know, I really like, um, you know, what I read at the website for LucidWorks. This sounds an awful lot like a framework for AI and machine learning. Yeah, it's, it's I think we, you know, really, we've kind of only moved uh, heavily into that space uh, more recently. The company's been around a long time. Um primarily as a search um, and then kind of search driven products, right. search driven engineering products um, uh, set up, you know, with you know, Lucene works is the, the, the place where, you know, 60 plus percent of the Lucene and solar code base, um, the commit, the commits 60% or the commits or so come from uh, employees at Lucene. Oh, wow. um, we've been, we've been, you know, 
the, the core you know, solar and leucine people have been with us for a long time. Not all of them, of course. They're all around the world. Yeah. It's one of the most uh, kind of uh, not single company uh, open source projects out right. there. Um, but we've been doing that for ages, and we've kind of added on to that, finding out that, you know, as people's expectations of what search um, will do have evolved to the point where, you know, I think that I used to be a pretty savvy search person, you know, search uh, customer. When I would, you know, type into Google my, my complex kind of Boolean type query, you know, back, you know, 15, 18 years right. ago. Uh, and I could get, you know, exactly what I needed out of Google. These days, I'll type, how do I replace the, you know, blade on my blah, blah, blah mower, full sentence, right. and I'll come up with a good answer. Yeah. And I've evolved the way I, I even do searches. I never used to do that kind of search because no search engine could handle right, it. Right, right. But now they can. And because everyone's doing that, when you go search on, you know, your local electronics store's website, you type in the same search query, and they're doing some, you know, MySQL search under the under the right. hood. It just returns total garbage. And people are like, oh, okay, I guess your search engine is broken. And they just, they, they make one try and then they step away. Mm -hmm. And so LucidWorks is trying to help, you know, make that, you know, bring that kind of style of search to to our customers that have data that isn't exposed to, um, to uh, uh, you know, Google search engine or, or, or Bing or whatever else. Gotcha. Um, and that does require doing a lot of uh, building kind of an IDE for uh, smart search, which is, you know, bolt on your recommender system, bolt on your personalized search bolt on your search that has trending information in it, bolt, bolt on the stuff that lets you build in, um, you know, uh, query intent classification as a module. Um, and that's sort of what we, we try to enable um, is, is um, you know, it's we build for engineers as well as for kind of the, the mom and pops that just kind of want to point and click, set up a, a, a smarter search system. But um, you know, it's 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 once again the the, the embarrassment of riches style thing. We we want to be all things to all people. We want to make sure that you know people, you know, developers can can write code into uh, our uh, framework and you know build a you know write Spark jobs to do um, you know to build machine learning models, um, wire them in so they're run at runtime on top of Solar, um, and. But at the same time, they don't have to do that if they don't want to. But yeah, it's it's um, I like it. It's fun. Interesting, and it's it's something that I hadn't really, I've experienced, but I hadn't really thought about it. Was that, you know, search engines like Google and Bing, you know, or just the search user experience has gotten so much better um, in the last twenty years. Really? I, I remember things like Alta Vista, and and you're right, you had to get the phrasing just right, otherwise you get garbage. But you're right, like you yep. know. Uh, there are both funny and scary things you see, like how do I uh, on YouTube uh, if you search there or Google. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, that's an interesting thing. I mean, everything from, you know, how to repair a toilet to how to almost to the point where, you know, how, to, how do I do brain surgery? Um, it's so much more natural of a language yeah. now. What do you think's driven that? Yep. Do you think and, that's and been that a, a, a function of processing that's power, more input data, or some, some combination of both? Um, and, and algorithms. I think we've just gotten much, you know, the, the whole notion of how search was done uh, when I first got into the field um, was very, you know, find matching tokens and collect together the matching tokens and kind of rank them based on the, the, the more rare and uncommon signal containing tokens are the ones that are going to weight higher and use that to score. And the scoring algorithms were very much based right. on the text alone. Um, and the, the, the real the real driving power for all for this like all things um, you know uh, data science or, or machine learning related is is the wealth of data is, is really what it all comes down to this comes down to the fact that people like uh, Google Amazon you know whoever else like that has giant piles of query incoming data and then what the user did you've got this feedback loop and because that's very proprietary data, that is the thing that like, it is, it is the proprietary, this is why, you know, um, you know, Twitter can have all their data be um, fairly public. All the tweets are, 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 are 95% or more of them are, are public. Yet, even if you can consume all that data, you 
You don't own the click right. data. You don't own the engagement data. They do. That's what drives all their value, seeing who clicks on what, who, who, who subscribes to what. Um, that information is what drives this relevance. And that's what um, the shift, you know, 20 years ago. So in the academic realm, of course, they don't have access to click logs, like almost anywhere, right? You know, if you, if you, try, you try to do searches on the web for, for click history, um, you know, data sets, they're very, very hard to find. And this is for good reason. You know, the, the, one of my old bosses uh, at Twitter was the guy at AOL who released the AOL search logs, if you remember that uh, scandal oh, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Um, and that was because the things that people put in search logs are um, very personally identifiable. Even if there's no user ID attached to it, if, if you've got someone searches you know, for a thing in this zip code that you can tell was around that zip code, you know, the, the number of data points you need to, to uniquely identify a person is extremely small, right? You can identify 98 or 99% of all people by zip code and date of birth, roughly. I think, that, I think those two, maybe you need one more, gender. I think that plus gender gets you 99% accuracy on identifying an individual in the U.S. Wow. Uh, so if, if you think about that, now you imagine having a, a series of search queries just the search queries alone is enough to often identify a user. So you don't have a lot of these public data sets because privacy um, is is null and void as soon as you start making these things very right, public. Right. Um, you can obviously, and there are there are algorithms to do this. You know, differential privacy is this kind of algorithm that has been researched a lot in the recent years that allows you to kind of fuzzify this information so that it it doesn't find its way back to identifying uh, particular traits. Um, but it's still kind of an emerging field. But back to my main point is, is this kind of stuff, um, you know, getting access to query logs, which, you know, Google has, Amazon has for their own users, um, lets you learn from, you know, what someone, when someone issues a, a query, this is one of my comment, my, my favorite um, kind of ambiguous queries. Um, if someone searches for a garage door opener, what are they looking for? Well, you would think a way to open their garage door. <laughs> but it, so, what kind of what kind of physical item? But it could be the remote or the whole system. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's that's the real key. And the thing is, if if you ask me, so I ask the question kind of in reverse of what I usually do. If I say, "What do you call the thing you hold or the thing inside your car that you push the button to get into your car?" People will say, "Garage door opener." Um, almost everyone I know will say that. But if you ask the manufacturers, what's a garage door opener? That's the device, that's the $700 device inside your garage on the roof that, that, that opens your garage. That other thing is the garage door opener remote. Right. And that difference right. is, is right. key because one's a, a $5 thing that you may, might need to replace a lot. The other is something you, you only install when you buy a house pretty much. See? Um, or you break it. Jay, you get my answer came out way too smart, Alecky. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, no, the, 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 it's it's a thing that like is it's funny. We we totally it's it is the thing that opens your garage. But which right. one is it? The 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 device or the thing you push to tell the See, I didn't get it. that. Frank picked up on it. Thanks for thanks for helping Jake out there. Frank. I got it. Uh, any- <laughs> um, we- but I imagine you sell a lot more remotes than the whole systems, like you said. So yeah, exactly. I guess the odds right. of so somebody go on Amazon and type in that in is, you know, is, is looking for the for probably a, a replacement battery or 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 the remote that they lost. Right. Um, right. So this is actually a case where 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 the data drives you the wrong direction, mm. actually, because someone searches for garage door opener, they probably mean the remote. Right. right. But because and so statistically, if you just look at the query logs for 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 sites that sell garage door openers and garage door opener remotes, and I, I've worked with many of these customers, so I, I I've seen this data, um, is yes, they're looking for the the clicker, <laughs> the thing that opens up, you, you push on the button of the remote, um, and so if you just let the user guide your your relevance, you'll start returning results that say, okay, this 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 you know seven dollar thing is what people want when they say garage door opener, that's great. Except for the case where now, if you want to get the actual device inside your 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 garage, the eight hundred dollar expensive device that actually has a very high um, uh, uh, revenue potential for the person selling this, how do they search for that? 
garage door opener, not the remote, the thing that's hanging from your car, <laughs> hanging from your garage. Like you, you can't even specify it because the thing you want to specify is garage door opener, not right. the remote part. So if, if you look at like a, you know, a real world, real world examples of where this is done right, what they effectively do is they try to disambiguate and they have to actually know that there is a thing that is a garage door opener. That's a thing that people aren't going to often use that. They're not going to specify it in their query often like right. that. But this is what it really means. And then there's this common parlance of what garage door opener remote kind of gets shortened to. And so what you do is you, you have autocomplete, you have an autocomplete setup that actually says they type garage door opener and you automatically autocomplete that to remote and you let them take that autocomplete, in which case that you know they want that and they didn't need to type it themselves because they would never think to do that. Or they see you've suggested it and you say, no, hit enter. I don't want the, I don't want to autocomplete that. I want to have garage door opener specifically. And then they've explicitly said they don't want the remote and then you, you feed them the ones that are the, the actual things. So it's a subtle UI experience as well as uh, kind of a data science question. Um, I don't know, a little bit, a little bit of diversion, but it's a kind of a fun problem that that search we we expect a lot from search these days. And and the... no, that's that's true. And yep. diversions are kind of like how we roll around here. I think we do. I think Andy and I both have terminal ADHD <laughs> or or whatever the. I, I um, agree. Yeah. Like good engineers, I suppose. <clears throat> What's interesting is, um, <clears throat> as you were saying that, excuse me, as you were saying that, I, I typed it into Amazon because, you know, Amazon, I think probably given their size and their, um, they're probably the, um, a good example of how yeah. to do things, you know, and I'll put, you can't see air quotes, but I'll say, right. Um, and what you see here is uh, what's interesting is, so I just typed in garage door. And before I even got to that, the first thing in the search thing is garage yep. door opener remote. And then below that, it's uh, it says in tools and home improvement, garage door opener, garage door keypad, garage door decorative hardware, okay, <laughs> and all sorts of things that you you know spray lubricant and the rollers and the seal, all sorts of stuff right. I would not have thought of. And and that's where autocomplete really can can help. And and that that is totally driven by what previous queries have done. You cannot build that really on top of uh, just a data set of what what's yeah. in your catalog. Interesting. Um, and that's what's really changed things, I think, is the real key, is that as, as everyone is on the internet now and everyone searches on the internet all the time, the people they search to are the people that are gathering this data. And it doesn't percolate out very quickly into academia because they can't really share that those raw logs. Um, right. Well, that's interesting you point out, because one of the things that I get asked a lot um, is, you know, hey, how come, you know, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they all share their algorithms? Yep. You know with the world like why do they yep. do that like you know and i think you just nailed it the money is in the data not necessarily Completely. algorithms yep that's exactly what it is they are data driven they're they're, they're more they're, their data is their yeah. foundation and it's is this interaction data is what they are completely built on that is their entire business value that's that's really I, fascinating that that is um i want to we've got a list of standard questions jake that we ask guests and loved, uh, by the way, they loved everything, totally loved everything in that, <laughs> that opening segment. Um, but how did you find your way into data? And would you say that data found you or you found data? Um, I think data sort of found me, but it was it was kind of inevitable. Um, so I didn't come into even even software um, from the from the, the the branch of computer science um, at all. I, I you know I've taken a grand total of one computer science class, uh, programming class in my life. It was intro to programming, and in, in, and it was back when we did that in C. Um, and we capstone of that course was was taking uh, you know programming Conway's game of life in ASCII on the screen. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was you know, so yeah, I'm I'm very young, um, but uh, yeah, no, I am. Um, I didn't, um, so I didn't really do any programming really in college, even though I was a um, physics and math uh, double major. I never did any, um, it was all pure theory and we didn't really do any um, computer-based stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I got jobs doing um, programming kind of for, you know, for a job, for summer jobs really, um, that led me into eventually uh, building 
search engines really it was it was you know built a early lucene based uh you know back when solar really wasn't quite as solid as it right. as it is now um things on top of lucene um to build indices secondary indices for for mysql um you know web apps um and i think just search led me into recommender systems which led me into you know all, remember remembering all the math i used to do um and all the math i used to do um has yielded uh great dividends when it comes to uh doing uh data science and data engineering um yeah, I look at your your background on LinkedIn. It's uh, impressive. I don't think there's a word that can do it justice. Um, so you were a physicist, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, I was, or I you, was in you... particle theory and 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 pure math um, for for the good chunk of until my mid to late twenties wow. or so. Uh, and uh, so this math there in data science is probably you know right up your alley. Yeah, no, it's it's great. It's um in some ways it's 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 too up my alley. I I, I love it and I like to do all the, the fun math stuff, but uh, really I'm not even a data scientist at heart. I'm a data engineer. Um, I do the, the the code side of things, um, but I really like doing the math side. I wish I was doing kind of more of that, but it's not what's really necessary most of the time. Most of what we do is is you know data cleaning and and the usual stuff. Um, that's, that's how you solve the problems. Um, it's not doing fun math. Math is fun, but, uh, you know, it's, it's 5% of the work. It's really hard. And most, most of us, you know, have to struggle with it. Um, even when we're trained at it, but, um, it's not most of what you need to do. Um, but I love it. Yeah. I love, I love, I love the math side of things. Linear algebra. Um, I, I have, I have, I have, uh, you know, a bone to pick with people who call things tensors that aren't really tensors. But other than that, that's maybe a different digression for another day. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, what's, uh, what's the, your favorite part of your current gig? Um, I think I covered a lot of that earlier on of saying that this whole full yeah. cycle thing. Um, right. But I guess if, if you want to say like specifically um, the part I like most is getting to work with a lot of real world mm -hmm. data problems, kind of like a consultant would, um, but not having to just jump from one consulting gig to the next. Instead, you know, split your time between put the fire out, solve the real customer problem, and then step back and say, okay, what can we build on top of this that really is going to solve the next 20 customers' problem? Right. Um, and actually kind of do some R&D. And kind of flipping back and forth between having real data, because as we said in this opening segment, having the real customer data is, is kind of key to doing any of this stuff. Um, and customer data from a wide variety of domains, whether it's you know e-commerce, uh, finance, biotech, um, news, um, getting to do that um, on these different data sets, and then try to you know build algorithms that handle all that differently um, is is what I really love best about the current game. That's very cool. So we have uh, some complete the sentence questions. Our first one is: When I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Long distance trail wow. running. I, I love running through the woods over mountains until I get so exhausted. I feel like I could eat the first <laughs> living thing I see. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. yeah I, I like, I like, I like running over the hills. I live in the Pacific Northwest, which this week, at least not such a great week to be um, doing running in the mountains. I tried that uh, Tuesday and I felt like I got an immediate sinus infection oh, from yeah, the air quality, the fires. but uh oh, wow. Yeah. The fires are, we have uh, five times worse uh, air quality Goodness than Beijing gracious. this week, which is pretty intense. Smoking nine cigarettes a day if you wow. spend the whole day outside. What? Yeah, not so great. But normally we've got fantastic air quality and I love running around <laughs> in the woods. So I have to ask, do you track uh, your runs with the uh, devices like a Fitbit or? Oh, yeah. I think, in fact, I started running late in life. I didn't really start mm -hmm. running until about five years ago. And I pretty much, within the first three months, someone turned me on to Strava. And uh, every run I've done since then has been tracked on Strava. So I've got my heart rate, my pace, my elevation, my distance um, tracked down to the millisecond um, on Strava wow. every day since then. Um, so I've got a great map, a great, a great heat map of the world. So I, I travel a lot, partly for work and partly because I've got family. All of my daughter's grandparents live in... Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the Western Mediterranean area. And so I spent a lot of time in Europe. So my heat map of where I've run on Strava maybe doesn't reveal, uh, you know, military bases like, uh, many of their <laughs> little recent data scandal, uh, led to, um, 
but it does track really cool places to, to, to visit and run around the world. Um, and it's uh, interesting. Yeah, every run I do. Uh, so another complete the sentence is, I think the coolest thing in technology is blank. Well, it's really, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say that, so I'm going to, it's got too much hype around it, but I'm going to say that I'm not going to be driven by things that, that, that have hype, uh, shouldn't be, you know, given their due, uh, deep learning is just changing the, the world of, of machine learning and, and, and data science in general. Uh, and it will continue to, I don't think it's, it's heading into any, any, we're not, we're not heading to any, um, you know, AI winter anytime soon. Um, regardless of the hype because it's it's showing some pretty fantastic promise on a lot of areas interesting yeah i agree it's it's fascinating that a lot of the algorithms we work with were have been in academia since yep. at least the 80s exactly. and some of them possibly longer than that yeah yep but we didn't have um we didn't have a you know a you know a pair or or quad of of cray supercomputers sitting on our desktops uh, in the 80s. Which is what the current, like NVIDIA, you know, you know, the good deep learning uh, GPUs these days, if you look at their compute power, it's like a 2001 yeah. Cray. So right. imagine doing that kind of algorithms in the 80s where every time you wanted to run your training, you'd be like, okay, I've got a quad of, of Crays to, to use just for me. I'm not sharing it with anything <laughs> in the rest of the company. And even without advances in algorithms, that would have been a world of different. And now take the fact that you can you know, fit a couple terabytes of data sitting on your desk as well. You've got the cloud you can store it in and don't have to worry about shuffling it around places. It's a right. kind of a game changer, even with not dramatically different algorithms. Right. Well, you could just rent, you know, a, a quad worth of craze for an hour or two and then shut yeah. it down. Yeah. Exactly. You know, six bucks or whatever. Yeah. Pretty yeah. amazing stuff. Uh, it is definitely a, a new age uh, compared to when I got started, probably back when you got started as well, Jake. Um, another yep. complete, another complete sure. sentence. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. Not have to drive so much. I, I, I love, uh, re, you know, I think one of these things, you know, one of the things that, you know, I found fun sci-fi question I like to ask um, uh, is, is what do you think people will look back on in a hundred years the same way we look back on, you know, slavery or 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 kids working in 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 coal mines yeah. at age eight or things that will just look back like totally nuts like what right. the heck were they thinking even though they were so smart and they were inventing all these great technologies in 100 years people look back on you people were driving these gas guzzling <laughs> one ton monsters at age 16 in the middle of the night randomly on roads where the best kind of coverage you had was like an occasional street light and that was considered totally reasonable I think people look back on that and think that was totally nuts. Yeah, I could see um, that. There were people that we were tracking. How many people are dying every day right. by that? And we know it. And we, yet we think it's just, oh, well, that's just the way things are. So I think once we get to a point where uh, technology enables us to not have to do that, it would be pretty awesome. That comes up a lot, self-driving cars slash, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. I think there's a real frustration because I think – uh, I think we've taken kind of the automobile about as far as we can go <laughs> uh, in yep. terms of that. Plus, I think we drive more now than I think typically than yeah. ever. I mean, I, the traffic is just... Cities, cities have gotten bigger, suburbs have gotten wider, yeah. traffic's getting heavier. Gone yeah, up. that's interesting. Yeah, I, I share, as someone who has to drive in a DC Beltway on a regular basis, uh, I share your I share your dream. <laughs> Yes. Um, so our last question is not a fill in the blank question. Actually, our second to last question. I have to update the last um, to reflect our season two. Uh, but share something different about yourself. But do remember that it's a family podcast and we have a clean rating on iTunes. Uh, <laughs> so keep it clean. Yeah, yeah. Um, something different. Um, when I first went out to college, I went. I was. I grew up in the East Coast, and I went out to college um, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, but uh, I was going to be about uh, two weeks early for 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 school to start because I got my plane ticket before I realized I hadn't been accepted into the kind of summer orientation fun camping excursion that um, I signed up for, but 
turned out to be too late for. Um, so I showed, signed up a week, a week early or two weeks early, and I landed at SFO. Never been to the San Francisco Bay Area before. I had not even visited the college. I signed up after my dad had visited and said, yeah, yeah, Jake, all the other ones you, you visited, they, you're not going to want to go to them. You're going to want to go here. And he was right. Um, I was a weird hippie kid, and that was the place to go. Um, and uh, I showed up at Powell Street Station and found and and a pair of six foot tall blonde ladies walk up to me. Swedish women <laughs> said, "Oh, are you a student?" And I said, "How did you guess? Was it the purple hair and the giant big backpack and it being September in San Francisco, um, and me looking clearly, you know, eighteen years old or so?" Uh, but regardless, long story short, um, I kind oh, of wow. accidentally got myself kidnapped by the Moonies. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. you remember the, the followers of Reverend Sun Young Moon. Yeah. Um, so I got brought up into the, the backwoods of Napa Valley uh, in at, at their compound uh, and spent about uh, 10 days convincing them that, you know, thanks for the hospitality, but I, I actually do have uh, some classes starting soon and I'm going to be uh, heading further south. Oh. They eventually dropped me off at a... Uh, I think it's Santa Rosa in the back of a pickup truck and said, here, you figure it out. And I had to find my way, having never been to Northern California from Santa Rosa wow. to, oh um, to Santa Cruz, which is yeah, so before Uber a Uber and um, GPS <laughs> was widely available. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, or even cell phones really. So uh, this, this, this was like, you know, get on a bus that heads South wow. and see where that bus takes you and then switch to another bus. And then think that you could walk from San Jose to Santa Cruz because it looks like there's only eight miles in between <laughs> and you forget that that means there's also a mountain range in between. Right. Wow. <laughs> it was a fun, a fun uh, well, story to tell. To tell it. Maybe not so fun yeah. in, the, in the experience. <laughs> I am around to tell it. And I didn't get, you know, slotted into a marriage ceremony with 10,000 other people in, 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 in uh, Madison Square Garden. Thank goodness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Close call. So our final question. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eddie. Yeah. I think that I think that might win for our answers on. <laughs> yeah, uh, on I was that thinking question. like. Yeah, I was I thinking like. I think that's the most like wow answer I think we've ever had. <laughs> All due respect to our previous guests. I would but, agree. But that's. I a, have to say this. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank God you're here to tell the tale. Yeah, it's different. That's for sure. <laughs> Uh, so yes. our final question is, um, do you listen to audiobooks? And if you do, do you have a, a one that you're particularly fond of? Okay. Yes, I do listen to audiobooks. Um, I, so I don't listen to any audio, you know, ongoing. So basically my daughter and I, um, every time we drive in the car uh, on the way to school, camp or wherever, uh, she's 10, and we've been doing this for a couple of years now. We basically listen to everything Madeline Lingle or Neil Gaiman has put on audiobook. You know, whether it's short story, long story, anything they've done. Oh, wow. Um, I think we've made it through basically everything they've written and put onto audiobooks. Um, if I've missed any, I'll try to find them. Neil Gaiman still writes books, so um, he will put more of them on audiobooks, and we'll keep, keep, keep listening to them. Um, but we love that. That's, uh, he's, he's a great, he's a great author. Uh, she's a great author too. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we do, we do that style of, of, of stuff to, to kind of open up your brain. Um, when I'm by myself, I do, um, uh, more nonfiction type stuff. Uh, but I don't do a lot of it audiobook wise. I like to read it, uh, on, on physical books. Um, but I do a lot of, uh, try to learn kind of, you know, Molecular biology, biochemistry, stuff outside my, my normal wheelhouse, kind of just follow pop science or pop uh, kind of humanity and, and, and society right. stuff, um, you know, the, that kind of stuff. Very cool. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So as we mentioned earlier in the show, they're a sponsor. You can get yep. a free book. Right. The Check Data Driven Book. The Data Driven Book. Book. Yep. Com. That's the that's place. So that. Um, that, I guess this is our last question. Maybe. Um, where can people learn more about you, Jake? Um, people can learn more about me. Well, you can find the, the kind of, you know, the, the top line, uh, um, what, what I do and what I've done, uh, of course, on LinkedIn. Um, 
And you should be able to find me on there because I helped build their search engine. <laughs> nice. Um, back when I worked at wow. LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, yeah. I worked at LinkedIn from 2008 or 9 to 12 or so. Um, wow. Or 10, maybe. 9 or 10. We're on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you were at Twitter. You were at the uh, Linear Accelerator and a few other interesting I've places. I've worked at yeah. a bunch of weird places. So if you want to see the kind of path that a, that a non-traditional data science, data engineer can travel, um, that's, that's a place to find it. Um, but, uh, you know, if you go to lucidworks.com, um, our blog often will have, um, I, I will blog on there sometimes, um, and, uh, they'll have links to, um, webinars and, um, maybe, maybe not podcasts. I think we've, we had some kind of podcast type things in the past. I don't know if we've got anything active now, but we definitely have uh, webinars and blogs. Um, and I've got some of those and I should be having more coming out throughout the year. Um, but I'm, I'll be at, um, uh, we've got a conference uh, in Montreal in uh, next is in early October is um, Lucid LucidWorks Activate it used to be called Lucene Solar Revolution and I'll be giving a talk there as well as many of my coworkers and all of our some of our customers and lots of people that just use Lucene and solar and AI that gets cool. bolted on top of them. Very cool. Well, that sounds good. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jake. I think it's awesome. Uh, some of the work you've done and um, definitely thanks for your time. Um, anything else you want to add, Eddie? No, just, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jake. Seriously. This was great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, and Frank. we'll let the nice British lady finish the show. Thanks for listening to data driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up, to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.